to tackle a complex, wicked problem like air pollution, you need to do mm. all the things. You need to do very well. That's why it gets very challenging. Right. And that is really how, when we look at any country, understand that we're only looking probably one way. It requires us to meet someone from that place, be there to understand anything at all. If I just make a conclusion about Kenya, knowing whatever I Google, yeah. I probably might just end up with sensationalistic news or um, mainly negative um, things rather than seeing for myself mm -hmm. how people there are very driven. The young people are very energetic. They are trying so hard to get a better education. No mm -hmm. news is thinking of putting that because they have a paywall and they need mm -hmm. to get paid. So what do you get out of sharing these things that are yeah. probably not that sexy, not that sensationalistic, but actually very hopeful. And hope is something that, thank goodness, from my lens as an Indonesian living in Indonesia, I see a lot of. Welcome to Brave. Learn from Southeast Asia's best tech leaders. Build the future, learn from our past, and stay human in between. No BS on success. I'm Jeremy Au, venture capitalist, serial founder, Harvard MBA, science fiction nerd, and dad of two daughters. Every week, we debate startup news, interview change makers, answer listener questions, and share personal insights. Join our movement of over 20,000 members and get transcripts, resources, and community at www.bravesea.com. Meet Rinkas, your go to digital mortgage platform breaking down financial barriers for home seekers across Indonesia and Southeast Asia. They operate in more than 15 cities in partnership with all major Indonesian banks and premier property developers. Rinkas is on a mission to democratize home ownership and create over 100 million new homeowners. Don't just dream about owning a home, make it a reality. Explore more at www.rinkas.co.id. Hey, Gita. Really excited to have you back on the show. It's been a year. Wow. Hi, Jeremy. Thank you so much for inviting me. Yeah, I think it's so amazing to continue to keep track of your journey. And you've transitioned since our last podcast interview from being a founder to venture capital and also becoming a Coffin Fellow. So tremendous changes. And I just said to myself, we got to catch up. We got to swap some notes, hear your story and also chat about Indonesia as a market because so many people actually still have these misconceptions about Indonesia as a market. They only see the bad news. So I wanted to make sure that we double click into that. Uh, but on that note, could you just introduce yourself real quick? Sure. Hi, Jeremy. Thank you so much again for inviting me back. Can't believe it's already been a year. Before this, I was a serial founder for 13 years. And then I joined the quote unquote dark side and became a venture capitalist. And I had investments at BNI Ventures, which is yeah. the venture arm for one of Indonesia's largest state-owned bank. I'm also driving their impact investment initiative. And I became a Kaufman Fellow last mm, year. Amazing. What a crazy amount of changes that you have. So I got to ask, what's it like yeah. joining the dark side? I'm also a founder turned VC. Yes. Uh, we can swap <laughs> notes, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, what's it like? Well, I think it was really important that I became an entrepreneur first before I became a venture capitalist. I joined investing mm. because I was one of those founders who thought, hey, are VCs who are not founders before, are they missing something? Are right. they missing a different viewpoint? Are right. they saying things that probably are not executable for right. a certain stage, for that uh, type of founder, for that sector? Is there something valuable that I can bring into the space if I right. just bring my 13 years of experience building businesses, the majority of which are bootstrap, actually? I only raised venture funding for one company out right. of four. Right. So I thought to myself, maybe I have something important um, to share, right. or at the very least, maybe I can be a better listener and be someone who gives people a shot and yeah. who listens to founders in a more empathetic way because I was one. And it really is just that. Can I bring a different voice? But most mm. of all, can I be a better ear for founders? Right. Yeah. And how has that experiment turned out to be? <laughs> <laughs> Are you a better uh, ear to founders? Wow, okay. I mean, maybe you're not, so, right? <laughs> wow. 
well. Actually, it's this, right? I think so much of my frustration back in the day as a founder, yeah. and I wasn't one of those founders yeah. who can raise yeah. a lot. No, I think a lot yeah. of venture capitalists from my, probably remember me as that person who tries yeah. really hard, but probably not the best fundraiser. Yeah. And that's why I bootstrap so much of yeah. my business. But at the very least, right. the most memorable investors I had were the ones who yeah. listened to me and right. the ones who at least would give me a shot or think the best of me, even though some of them never invested in me. But we became right. close friends because they listened. And I realized listening to anyone at all is actually a super important skill set that is right. highly underrated in today's world because there's so much drive to prove we're better mm. or we're smarter. There's so much drive to show off who we are that we forget to listen and make other people feel important. So right. I realized, although it sounds like, hey, everyone can listen, but that's actually not true. True. A lot of people cannot, and probably because we've lost that skill set along the way in a world that is so loud and noisy. And this entire year, I've really just focused on learning more about that founder, learning more about their mission, how they look at a market, how they see the business, because I wanted to see, is there possibly a diamond in the rough that other people are not looking at um, because they're busy trying to see if that person fits a pattern. So I think mm. so much of the way I approach it is, is there something that other people are missing that I right. can at least try to see? Who's the diamond in the rough? Who's looking at this right. problem in a fresh yeah. way? Who cares so much about the market that they'll pivot whichever which way in order to get the solution that the market needs, mm. not just what the market right. wants or what's a nice to have, but really what the market cannot live without. And what's interesting yeah. is that I actually felt this very same, which is I think the job is very much about gatekeeping and selection. So you're pattern matching to be like, yes, okay, who is going to be knocked yes. out of the park and everybody else can fly a kite. And, you know, there's a very strong, because you're looking at thousands of companies and you're going to invest in five or 10, right? The right. ratio is bonkers. And I think what I tell myself all the time is, you know, Jeremy, just don't be the asshole VC that you hated when I was a founder. Because actually... Yes. The habits are there because the truth is if you've got a filter for five out of a thousand, the incentives are there to just move on and be very yeah. curt and do it. But I think maintaining yeah. the humanity for the other 1,495 founders is the hardest part. Yeah. What do you think about that, yep. Gita? I think we talked about this on the phone. Yeah. We just basically said, don't be an asshole. <laughs> I mean, it's fairly simple. It is fairly simple. Yeah. And so when whenever I speak to founders, I might overthink it, to be honest, yeah. Yeah. where I really double back and go, wait, was I an asshole? Did I just say all the wrong things? What did I do? But it helps me improve and develop my listening listening skills. And right. at the very least, it is a constant wake up call for me because right. I meet founders all the time, like several right. people a day that right. every day I'm always asking myself, OK, was that the best? Were you reactive? Did yeah. you say things because you suddenly felt the need to prove something? Did you yeah. give an advice that maybe you shouldn't be giving? Right. Are you saying things without that much knowledge? I mean, that right. person probably knows more about their market than you. That yeah. person probably knows more about their company than you. Yeah. Yeah. What was driving your feedback? And I think about that a lot. So it's been very helpful that I also write after a lot of my meetings. I, I just write the learnings or I sometimes remind myself, maybe don't say it in that way or refrain mm. from uh, giving advice or refrain from this. And a lot of it is because when I was a founder, I remember right. getting a lot of advice, the majority of which, again, is not executable for the stage right. or the sector that I was in. And it was very annoying um, because it yeah. felt felt like, did you even listen to me? Did you hear my yeah. challenges? Did you realize that I have no funding to do what you just said? Yeah. <laughs> did you think about how I felt? And I realized that no matter how smart you are or how smart anyone is, the most powerful thing you can give to someone is a feeling. That's really something people cannot forget. People yeah. will not forget if you make them feel heard or yeah. if you make them feel that you've given them a chance or that you've really taken into account their struggle, people won't forget that feeling. You're being the yeah. smartest person in that sector. Well, there's always smarter people in anything. Right. And after a while, like it's quite forgettable because everybody's mm. always jumping in to give everyone else advice. So many pieces. Mm. Let me tell you what I think what I would yeah. do. And a lot of founders are here going, what you would do <laughs> if you also had no money like me, if you're also yeah. running out of runway like me, are you sure about this? And I really want to give people that benefit of the doubt and just give them that 
feeling that, hey, I'm listening to you, whether or not I agree with you, but at least I'm listening to you. And I realize that your thinking and your feelings are valid, whether or not that is necessarily always true, or that is always as bad or as challenging or as positive or as negative as you think it is. Because sometimes what we feel and what we think aren't always necessarily 100% true. So when people say, no, my business is totally the absolute best, or my business is definitely going downhill, it doesn't always mean that it will. Yeah. Sometimes maybe your business is just going through a hard time and you'll be fine. But that's why at the very least, if I can mm. validate that, hey, yeah, I, I see you, I feel you, then mm. yeah, I, I'm, I'm okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I agree with you about the validation and people remember how they feel after that meeting. And when I think to myself about my past fundraising conversations as a founder, the truth is I kind of laugh at some of my pitches I had last time. I'm like, I have this old experience. I am like, oh my God, my deck was terrible. I was totally, you know, did not answer that question well. So I have these, I take a shower and it just pop comes in my head. I was like, now that I think about it, I really botched that meeting, didn't I? Yep. Uh, yep. I think there was a time when I was pitching, it was the first company, it was a social enterprise and we was speaking with some philanthropic requirements. And at some point there was this giving lots of blah, blah, blah. I ended the meeting, but I remember I was kind of cheery. I <laughs> at the end of the meeting. And I think I was a little bit like, okay, you don't get it. And there's the vision so far. Anyway, and I was thinking about that recently. And I was like, oh man, I could have done that better. But it's part of the learning process. And I remind myself a lot of the time is I'm sitting down with someone, a founder, and I'm like, yeah, maybe they're not good right now, but they could get better. And probably they will get better yeah. because if you're a founder, you're entrepreneurial, you're open to feedback. It's just, it just takes time. Right. You can't improve in one week, but over a course of five years, 10 years, 15 years, you get better. And so I think I tell myself all the time, okay, just, just try your best and then take it from there. So for I yourself, I know that you I became a Kaufman Fellow as well as part of your learning journey. So I want yeah. to hear about the experience. What was it like? Oh, Kaufman, right. So I actually didn't know much about the yeah. program because when I tried to Google it, yeah. a lot of things didn't come out. <laughs> yeah. So I actually applied because my brother, who is also an investor, highly recommended uh, the program saying that I think it would benefit you to yeah. meet a lot of people from different backgrounds. Right. And so when I applied, I ended up contacting, I don't know, 12 alums and a lot of them are cold calls. Like they don't know who I was when I became that creep on LinkedIn. (laughs) When I became that that random person who just popped by in in their chat. But I was so surprised how many people were receptive. I was so surprised how many Kaufman fellows literally just talked to a random stranger who popped up just to share about the program. And that's huge for me because then it made me ask, what is this thing? Like, how come they have such nice people? What is going on? (laughs) And I think at the time, because I was going uh, full time into being an investor, I wanted to meet more investors. I wanted to understand more about the sector because I wonder, can I do this? Am I even able to become as good of an investor as a lot of people I look up to? Mm. So there's a lot of doubt, a lot of insecurity during that time. And I thought if I can learn even more from other people, that would be best. And so when I applied to Kaufman, to be honest, I really didn't think I'd get in just because although I was an angel investor for a long time and at the time I was building a fund, I I thought I don't have 20 years of experience. I'm probably too young for this or I'm probably Mm. not good enough and not experienced. So I was very surprised that when I get in, they said to me, oh, we see so much potential in you and we really would like to help guide you to become Mm. the best human that you can Mm. be. And I thought that was a very interesting outlook, actually, when they said the best human, because I thought it is about investing. And then they went, well, no, I mean, this is about being the best you, because if you're the best human, then most likely you're probably also going to be the best investor you can be. And also the you at work and the you at home and the you anywhere else is still you. You're not this chopped up thing. You're not a chopped up persona that exists differently in different stages. You always retain some you in almost everything. So if we can optimize that, then that would be best. And so far, it's been a huge uh, eye opener for Mm. me, meeting fellows from so many different countries and so many different stages. There are people managing a $10 million fund all the way to, I don't know, 300 billion AUM and more 
more, of course, more. So the range is humongous. No one there feels like they're judging anyone because it's like you're in your lane and I'm in my lane mm -hmm. and I'm just doing my journey. And probably one of the biggest um, lesson was in one of the modules, the speaker said, hey, as you can see, by the way, that topic was thesis. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we had speakers that had, I swear, 20 different investment theses, like all 20 speakers mm -hmm. had 20 different theses. Wow. But they're all pretty successful in their own mm -hmm. right. And they're all mm -hmm. happy. And one speaker said, I really hope you understand now that it's not really just about the investment thesis and the strategy, but it's also about what strategy can you execute that will help you sleep at night? Mm. And that for me just encapsulated that Kaufman experience, which is that diversity of investment thesis, background, interest, but all of us just pursuing our lane and our journey and our progress according to our timing and just seeing what life journey can you do that will help you sleep at night? Because it's pretty mm. useless to run a huge fund. If mm. It's just going to make you feel feel bad most of the time knowing mm. that fun life is really long too yeah oh boy <laughs> are you sure you yeah. want to hate your life for 10 plus one <laughs> Yes. Are you sure that that's where you want to go? And I think I really love that learning that there are so many ways you can be successful, so many ways you can thrive, so many ways you can define success. And it's about finding that joy in yeah. however way you decide to execute that vision. Right. And what's interesting is that obviously sharing about how Kaufman has provided you, I think, a new community, obviously. One, two is obviously thinking through yeah. your work and the career as well as some of the skills yeah. needed to think about investment thesis. From your perspective, yeah. how do you think about Kaufman Fellows in terms of skills building, memo writing? Do you feel like that's relevant yeah. or you think it's a different plane altogether? Of course, we have resources for that, but I think it's just so much more than that. And I like right. that when I went in, I ended up feeling challenged more about me as a whole, my values, my vision. Those parts were challenged way more than just the writing and yeah. the technical skills. Because technical skills, when you look at Kaufman Fellows, many of us already have mm. a master's degree or PhDs. So it's not technically we don't have a background already. Yeah. So it's more about then how do you optimize that? Because in the end, writing an IM or any of that is a technical skill. If you really want to improve it to the next level, you yourself have to improve to the next level. Right. Right. Basically, I really believe your organization, fund, company, whatever it is, can only grow as much as you grow. So yeah. a lot of the issues that I had back then when I was a founder and the issues I see a lot of founders have now is simply maybe they have not grown enough to help their company grow or I have not grown enough yeah. to help my company grow. It's very different to take a company from ideation to revenue, but then have a 1 million uh, ARR company versus a 100 million ARR company. Yeah. Different leadership skill sets, different uh, management skill sets. And I think so much of the knowledge that I'm getting from Kaufman is more about how do you level up? How do you break your own upper limit, uh, mm. which is a concept that so many of us have mm. when you're yeah. like, hey, I feel so stuck. I never got better, quote unquote. Mm. Hey, how come like every time things are about to get better, it fails? Oh, hey, how come I never get to be like that guy? I can be as good yeah. as him. But uh, when we're in such great uh, positions such as mm. running a company or being part of a fund or being the founding uh, members of a company, we're already in a situation where you're just so much more blessed than so many of the population that really after mm. a while, maybe it's you holding yourself back. And right. we do it all the time with lots of stuff and could be limiting beliefs, could be like baggage, could be mm. trauma, could be whatever it is where we go. And we probably say it not realizing it like we go, hey, I don't know. I don't think you can run a successful career and be a great husband or, or be a great wife. I don't think you can be a great parent and also manage a huge fund. We probably have so many mm. of these running around in the back of right. our mind and they hold us back. Uh, yeah. from really leveling up in life, right? Whatever leveling up looks like. Yeah. Because leveling up doesn't also mean you become a billionaire. It could also mean maybe you just retire early and yeah. lead an idyllic country lifestyle. <laughs> Who knows? But it requires 
requires a lot of self-awareness right. and a lot of people, including me, yeah. well, I used to just live my life on a checklist to checklist basis, mm. you know, new goal unlock. Okay, let's go to right. the next goal. Not even realizing if I want those goals, not even right. realizing if I like what I'm doing Wait. really, but getting the validation from other people and like list and what people say in society and going, hey, that means I'm doing well. well. Not really questioning, hey, are these other people's metrics or are they your metrics, yeah. Pita? Whose is it? Yeah. And I think, you know, I think the program really challenges me in that. Are these mm. my metrics or are they other people's metrics? Are these my definition of success or am I just following other people's definition? Is this the race that I even want to do? Or am oh. I just like joining a race because I keep thinking that is the race everyone should do? Mm. What, are, what are these shoulds, right? And so it's about that. Yeah. And one interesting thing we were discussing on the side before was also talking about how I think as part of the Common Fellows and as part of this global travel community, you also realize yeah. that people have differing misconceptions about Indonesia as a country and where you come from. And yep. So I wanted to hear what are the common yep. misconceptions that people have about Indonesia from your perspective? Oh. Yeah. Sure. So I've also had a huge privilege for working with the Coordinating Ministry of Maritime and Investment Affairs for yeah. their climate yeah. policies right. in their climate task force. Right. So I have had almost two years experience working mm. with public sector. All of this is purely voluntary because yeah. I like putting myself into free internship positions. And, <laughs> hey, you're saving the world. And, and it's been super interesting seeing both the public and private sector view of mm. Indonesia. Mm. Mm. So mm. Indonesia, as we all know, has been fairly blessed with not going through a recession, so mm. strong economic growth, inflation under check at 5.1%, 5.2%. Yeah. So everything the last several years, especially during the pandemic, have bode well for Indonesia's um, right. economic um, condition. At the same time, no, is it a utopia? Absolutely not. Mm. Indonesia has a ton of issues. You can probably Google one right now about our air pollution. But that's why it's so important to not just mm. see the world as very black and white and the world is very binary, like going, oh, screw public sector, screw private mm. sector. It's actually so mm. important that everyone work together and see where the values are aligned and where they intersect because so much of the best things that Indonesia have done right have been. Mm. And that is something right. that I see in the last, I would say, maybe 10 years. There have been more of a push of aligning public and private sector values and not have it be so divisive. I think a lot of the division that we see in politics today have also been because of political agendas, when in fact, almost everybody in Indonesia wants very similar things. If you think about it, we mm. want a nice life for our family. Right. We just have different definition, of course, of what nice is. We also have different definition of how we get it. But yeah. in the end, it's been fairly consistent that people want good education for their children, good health care. And a lot of the struggle have been how to get there. And how do you uh, define a good enough healthcare? How do you define a good enough educational system? But I think the issue is when we look at any country or any region from one lens only, which is whatever social media or whatever news outlet tell you. Mm -hmm. When I hear stuff about Indonesia, it's always, oh, I hear you're all just really poor. And mm -hmm. I hear that you're all struggling. And that's just always one part of the equation. Do people struggle? Yes. Is there poverty? Sure, right? Yeah. Just like pretty much anywhere on earth. But are there also huge achievements by a country that as an electoral democracy is only 25 years old since 1998 when we right. took out the dictator Suarto? Absolutely. You cannot deny for a 25-year-old country to now become almost $5,000 GDP per capita. That's a massive achievement. Huge. A lot of places that deposed of a dictator would take many more decades until they're able to achieve a level of economic growth and also political stability that Indonesia have today. Mm. Now, if even we're thinking of political stability, just think about it. It's only been an electoral democracy for 25 years. Yes, it's one of the biggest in the world for that. And also, it's so important to not look at politics in Indonesia or in any other country, to be honest, mm. using your lens. So I get mm. a lot of, for example, journalists from Western countries asking, mm. oh, but if one person gets elected, then the other policies in the past will all go to hell and die. 
die and it's okay. We also don't experience a level of yeah. hyperpolarization right. that a lot of Western countries have, right. which honestly probably they have because they have hundreds of years of political history. Yeah, yeah. A very large GDP per capita, you know, yeah. 75,000. Hello, that's very yeah. different. They're at a stage where in a strange way, they can afford to cleave themselves into two sometimes, right? Because for example, the entire economy of California is already bigger than the entire economy of Indonesia. It's one trillion dollars is Indonesia and California is one point trillion. Yeah. So in a way, places like the United States or maybe UK even, they can probably split and right. maintain two fully functioning countries. And that's when, in that sense, they can afford so much hyperpolarization, which is something that Indonesia in general just doesn't have. So right. every time people go, yeah, you're all so unstable. I'm like, all right, let me set the scene for you. If in the US, Obama and Trump goes head to head, let's say Obama wins and then hires Trump to be one of his yeah. one of his ministers. And then Trump ended up endorsing Obama. Can you even imagine that scenario unfolding? And they're like, oh, absolutely yeah. not. And I'm like, okay, that happened in Indonesia. That really right. did. Two people went head to head, one won, which is President Jokowi. And then he invited the guy who lost to work in his cabinet. And yeah. this guy who lost ended up being Pao Jokowi's supporter now. Yeah. Can you even imagine that happening? So this is what I mean when I say the country is just not the type to have this deep hyperpolarization that is lasting. Yeah. Bad news makes for good headlines. And I think that what you describe <laughs> is nice and sweet and doesn't give me that clicking feeling. I want to see things going down in flames. No. I want to see knives right. <laughs> and betrayal, you know. Oh, I mean, I think there's so much going on in Indonesia. And I think these people yeah. just kind of like, I don't know what's the word, like they just want to see the bad stuff. And of course, bad stuff happens, like you said. But, you know, you got to look at the yeah. broader arc, right? I think what was interesting, of course, is also the news is often set in the context of the US-China dynamic. So everything's coming 100%. through that prism nowadays. So yeah, I was reading CNN. It's right. always Singapore. Is it choosing America or China, right? And it's, it's you know, changed Singapore for any country, oh. right? It's like Laos, Cambodia, Philippines. You know, so everything's kind of really going through that prism right now, which is actually interesting because it also reminds me how much of my media diet is American-centric in that sense, right? Yes. I mean, if you're reading yeah. New York Times or Wall Street yeah. Journal... Or even The Economist, which is, you know, very British, but it's still a very Western perspective. It is. That is such a good point. Um, and I hate to say it because I went to school in the U.S. a lot. I went for yeah. my undergrad. Two of my master's degrees are from the U.S. That's right. so much, <laughs> so much of my news and yeah. not just political or economic news, even entertainment news yeah. come from a very Western land. Right. And I have to remind myself all the time that to look at whatever situation I'm in right. the way it is rather than right. the way I think it should be or the right. way I think that other countries have done it better because the reality is the reality. Right. I'm not saying you shouldn't make things better. You should 100% make things better. Yeah. But it's so important to not always look at things using our very limited lens and right. be very aware that all of us do have a limited lens. Right. I have a limited lens. I definitely don't know enough about the country like someone who have only gone to school in the country and have yeah. only uh, worked in the country and have probably never left the country. So yeah. we all have very different lens. And so much of it is just balancing out all of our mm. perspectives and never just never having to be. There's this great saying like, would you rather be? right or have a relationship would oh. you rather be right or foster oh. foster why is that such a tough question right? <laughs> <laughs> like why are we going down this road why do we need a relationship but i could no, be but, always but, right <laughs> but the, but the thing is like now in my meetings in the public sector i also meet yeah. with other public sector yeah. workers from other countries i negotiate with governments from other countries i'm like right. i listen to their viewpoints i see how they view us and yeah sometimes you realize that we're all just very committed in how we see yeah. things. And that can be as simple as just to myself and reminding myself from my master of public administration, master that I have been very like dogged in pursuing is yeah. to remind myself that all of these social problems are wicked problems.
problems. They're very complex. They're yeah. rarely just one side. They're usually right. very nuanced. They encapsulate like lots of people's like viewpoints and thought processes and values and logic. And just once I keep telling myself that, I also find it much easier to not demonize any one cause or any one person because it right. doesn't, honestly, it doesn't help anything. And it also simplifies things to the point where it doesn't help the situation. For example, mm. to be honest, the air pollution in Jakarta is really terrible. I can't deny mm. that. It is really bad, period. The yeah. end. But yeah. just like the situation back then in Beijing, it's not about saying, oh, if you do one thing, it'll make everything right. Unfortunately, to tackle a complex, wicked problem like air pollution, you need to do mm. all the things. You need to do, I don't know, eight things. And you need to do those eight things yeah. very well. And that's why it gets right. very, very challenging. Right. And that is really how, when we look at any country, just understand that we're only looking probably one way. And I feel that because I just came back from Kenya, which was a yeah. huge wake up call for me. I ended up going to Kenya for a Kaufman summit and yeah. Meg Whitman is now the U.S. ambassador to Kenya. And right. she said that I think of Africa back then when I was working at Hewlett Packard only 1% of the time. Now that I'm here, I wonder why not more companies think of a more uh, thought out global strategy, right? right? Sometimes, unfortunately, it requires us to meet someone from that place, be there to understand anything at all. If I just make a conclusion about Kenya, knowing whatever I Google, yeah. I probably might just end up with sensationalistic news or uh, mainly negative um, things rather than seeing for myself mm -hmm. how people there are very driven. The young people are very energetic. They are trying so hard to get a better education and things like that are just things that you're right, Jeremy. No mm. news is thinking of putting that because they have a paywall and they need mm. to get paid. So what do you get out of sharing these things that are yeah. probably not that sexy, not that sensationalistic, but actually very hopeful? And hope is something that, thank goodness, from my lens as an Indonesian living in Indonesia, I see a lot of. Wow. I think that's a great way to wrap on and I'd love to summarize the three big takeaways I got from this conversation. First of all, thank you so much for sharing about your professional yeah. transition from founder to VC and also a lot of the experiences from both sides of the table and thinking through quite carefully about what experience you would want have wanted as a founder. But also I think the difficulties actually of how to be a VC who's thinking about it and trying to improve and iterate on that. So I was saying very nice to hear about how you are writing and debriefing and thinking to yourself how you can improve every meeting that you're having. So really a great sharing about that that I really empathize with. Uh, secondly, thanks so much for sharing about Coffin Fellows. It's a very low profile fellowship for people in venture capital. So I think it was nice to hear about your experience, about what you took away from it. But also what you experience researching and eventually joining and experiencing the program was. Lastly, thanks so much for sharing about the misconceptions about Indonesia as a market and talking at a very high level about how people should be breaking out of their limited views out of the bubbles and also recognize the influences and incentives that shape a lot of the news environment around us. So I thought it was nice to hear about your own personal experience, sharing about the Indonesian experience from a policy with several examples for air pollution, about politics, and your own personal lived experience as well. So on that note, thank you so much for sharing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for inviting me. And I hope for anyone who's really curious about Indonesia, you can just visit. You can just <laughs> travel there and maybe see for yourself what is going on. Yeah, or at the very least, just reach out to a lot of the great founders and investors we have in the region. You can find them. And so many of us are very keen to talk more about Indonesia and share with you what we see and what we experience on the ground. Amazing. Thank you for listening to Brave. If you enjoyed this episode, please share the podcast with your friends and colleagues. We would also appreciate you leaving a rating or review. Head over to www.bravesea.com for member content, resources, and community. Stay well and stay brave. Stay brave.